Welcome to Wellness by Designs. I'm your host, Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us today is Emily Pickering, a naturopath and pH candidate, who's going to be telling us all about why we should be using PEA, or palmitol ethyl olamine. Welcome to Wellness by Designs. Emily, how are you going? Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me, and good job at pronouncing PEA. It, it is a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> I still think I stumbled it. on that old thing. Yeah, it's so yeah, much easier to say, um, what is it, phenylethylamine from ice cream? So much easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emily, right. tell us first a little bit about your history. You're, you're a naturopath. What drove you to do a PhD with, this is uh, University of Queensland, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a PhD student um, at the University of Queensland in the School of Pharmacy. Um, which works very well for the field that I'm studying, which is herbal medicine and nutritional medicine and um, its role. My f research is particularly in glucose dysregulation, type 2 diabetes, um, so the School of Pharmacy was a good fit for that. Uh, but, yes, I'm also a naturopath. I finished my degree in um, health science naturopathy in the end of 2019 and about halfway through my degree, uh, I had I had a bit of a mid-degree crisis moment, I guess you could say. I was in the middle of an assignment and I was getting just really frustrated at the time with trying to write an assignment and showing, you know, my references, trying to find like good uh, human use studies that showed the efficacy of you know, the, the treatments that we use, so herbal medicines and nutrients and, like, energetic medicines. Um, and it was during this one particular assignment I just got so frustrated and I was like, why are there no good human studies on this? Or, like, why, why you know, there's so many animal studies, which is, you know, or, or empirical evidence, which is really important, but, you know, trying to find really, really good resources and, you know, that evidence that, like, a lot of, the the medical community needs to to really take us seriously and to you know really look at it and go oh okay yes you know i i you know can see that there is you know promise in these treatments rather than going oh you know it's as uh i have come across a lot of people go oh it's you know some hogwash so i got really frustrated and i was like well I'm going to try to do something about this like you know if if i can get into research and you know maybe support try, um, the the development of more research for herbal medicines and nutraceuticals and you know the stuff that, that we are all really passionate about as naturopaths and like the practice of naturopathy and the principles behind naturopathy you know it's like if if i can help bring more research out and and develop also good quality studies like you know you you double blind studies your placebo controlled studies so science so the the whole science community can really look at the evidence we've got and go okay this is good quality i'm going to read this i'm going to take it on board i'm not just going to disregard it so that's been on yeah. like the mission that i've been on um and so then i did a re a little while i was in my degree i did a little research project with dr janet slosh and that was really great it kind of like went okay yeah i like doing this and i wrote an article for that and um then i got in contact with dr elizabeth steels who is my mentor she's one of my phd supervisors um and i work with her in her clinical trials um so yeah i've done now a in my phd a clinical trial um with dr steels using pea um for people with type 2 diabetes um, who had peripheral neuropathy and we used pea with them um, to see how effective that was for that particular pain because it's quite difficult to treat uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, so, yeah, and there wasn't a lot of studies so far with PEA and that specific sort of type of treatment and particularly the form of PEA that we were using. Um, so that's been um, one of the big projects in my um, uh, PhD so far. The other research, um, the other part of my PhD has been using looking at herbal medicines for particularly pre-diabetes because that's another difficult group um, to work with as well because their blood sugar fluctuates so easily. 
Um, we've mm -hmm. been, yeah, looking at that and seeing if herbal medicine can kind of show evidence. Like we know they were, they're, they're treatments that have, we've used in clinic, well, like one particular one we've used in clinics for so much, you know, all the naturopaths know about it, but getting good studies about it can be difficult because, um, yeah, their blood sugar fluctuates so much. So it's, it's yeah, I'm really about um, creating good quality research that we can use in clinic but is also recognised by the greater scientific community to really help people, help naturopaths get more respect, basically. Yeah, but also to guide, you know, proper clinical applications to it. I totally take your point about, you know, the, the frustration looking at good human studies, even for innocuous fibres, for instance, mucilages mm. like um, slippery elm. Good luck trying to find a human yeah. trial. And yet it's been around for donkey's years. It's almost like a given. So it's, it, you know, one would think, oh, why would you make a human trial on water? But, but, um, but <laughs> the problem with natural medicines, as you know, is that it's very hard to patent a slippery elm unless you patent mm. an extract. And then, of course, it becomes company-sponsored um, research, which is denigrated, even though pharmaceuticals are company-sponsored research not denigrated. Um, it's, so there's this real inequity, but that's a whole podcast. I'm hoping to do a podcast on my own channel about this, um, about this inequity of how things are judged. And I, I hold myself guilty there as well. I used to do that myself. So let's get on a little bit into our topic. So firstly, PEA, can you tell us what it is exactly and take us through how it works in the mammalian um, in mammalian biochemistry. Yeah, no worries. Um, so PEA is an amazing molecule. Our bodies actually make it itself. Um, it's an endogenous fatty acid. So our body makes it. You can um, get sources of it from food, but it's only really small amounts. Um, so our body makes it itself. It's part of the animide system um, which is also the like the endocannabinoid system so it works by um so yeah basically our body makes natural levels of it and it has an analgesic effect so um when we're healthy when we're not going through lots of high levels of stress or if we don't have you know um an infection or a lot of inflammation going on our bodies naturally have um good levels of it that help us you know uh, with pain sensations so when you know we we cut ourselves and it eventually stops hurting or you know we we injure ourselves and you know eventually the pain goes away when we're under a lot of stress or if you've got a chronic health condition or um, for instance in the study that i did people with diabetes and there's that like high blood sugar levels and there's a lot of inflammation going on the oh. pea is the process the, the manufacture of pea in the body gets changed and we actually start producing the pro-inflammatory molecules so what that means is that you start feeling more pain um, or, you know, pain medications. You might end up having to, some people will take more and more pain medications because basically the body stopped making its natural analgesic effect. The other beauty with PEA is that it's also an anti, has anti-inflammatory action, particularly with to do with mast cell activation. It's great for that. Um, and also certain inflammatory markers, like in my research, I looked at its effects on interleukin-6, which is very, um, there's a lot of that activated in diabetes. Um, so what it also helps to do is to tone down inflammation. And, and as I was saying, when you're chronically ill, when you've got, you know, that, that long going, um, illness like something like diabetes or osteoarthritis and all those clinical um you know things that we see that you know it's going to take a long time there's, there's been a lot of build up there's a lot going on under the surface um that disrupts that pa production and we've found by you know with those chronic conditions supplementing PEA has given back that analgesic effect. It's helped to tone down some of that inflammation that PEA works on, those, those inflammatory markers. 
um, and you know, it, people have gotten um, pain relief. They've gotten um, reduction in their inflammation that you can see in the clinical symptoms, but also like we've done blood tests and it's shown that it's brought it down. So um, it's also other studies come out on um, other effects as well. And exercise, it helps with lactic acid. So I've actually, I usually use it before I go for a run and it like stops the lactic acid burn. It's great for that. So yeah, it's, it, that's a whole nother area for, for potentially for sports. Um, but the thing with PEA that people really need to understand, particularly with its biochemistry and its mechanism of action is that it's actually lipophilic. It doesn't, it needs to go through that cellular fatty acid membrane, which is so important. If you actually put like regular non um, emulsified PEA into water and stir it around, a lot of the, the what's called micronized will actually stay clumpy. You can see it is. It's like trying to mix B vitamins or, or something. You pass know, or pass. Not fat yeah. soluble. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can see it, it's a powder. So what that happens is that when it hits the intestinal lining, the microvilli, you know, they, they've they got all that lipid bilayer on it, it's not going to absorb it easily. It doesn't go through those water-soluble channels. So that's been the big issue with PEA and using PEA is that it doesn't absorb well. Only about 30% of raw, unadulted PEA actually gets absorbed through that microvilli. So there's been you know you've had to do you really high doses or you know the early studies showed that you know while it helped it didn't really get absorbed well so it wasn't taken up as a big thing for a long time um but what's been coming out more and more in recent years is changing you know there's there was micronized versions now there's ultra micronized versions and even the the studies on the ultra micronized versions so that it's though that's still not greatly absorbed yeah. Um, so what's been found is by um, emulsifying it and making it more fat soluble, it's able to be absorbed better now. And, and that's where the really um, interesting research and effects coming out have shown that by emulsifying it, you're really getting like that, that punch, that, that showing the effects it, of what PEA really can do. It's, it seems to me to be a very similar story to curcumin. Um, you know, the original uh, research, the original theory, if you like, of curcumin being an anti-inflammatory was based on Indian um, culture, um, using it in their foods and always, never, never without, always with some form of fat, whether it be ghee, cream, whatever. Um, and, and yet we take it into our Western thinking and we just want to take it with a glass of water. So that dose unit has to be in a form which will be absorbed, preferably with, you know, as you say, like other foods or something like that. But can I ask about, did the previous research that wasn't emulsified, did they use it with food? Was that enough to change the absorption if they took it with fatty food or something like that to initiate bile acid flow? Um, you know, pancreatic enzymes, or was that just, no, that's the 30% that they got? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I haven't read yet a study that has shown that it was taken with food. It could be out there. I've just not read it. So um, that's a very good question. But in clinic, like in clinic, because it is lipophobic, um, I do recommend for people if they're taking like if they if you're going to use the micronized version or the ultra micronized version taking it with food especially like you said like similar to turmeric um yeah. having it with like some fatty food that will really help with that absorption um so yeah, yeah that's a really good way to to get around that poor bioavailability but even then you're pushing it uphill because you're sort of crossing your fingers hoping that you're going to get higher than that 30 percent you mentioned so, yeah, so yeah. What, they're, got, yeah. What, they're, what they're for, what sort of absorption do we get with the emulsified form? Well, the emulsified form, um, there was a really good study done um, that compared it to the regular um, micronized PEA. And what they found is that uh, one arm took micronized and one arm took the emulsified PEA and they tested their levels for eight hours. 
And what they found is that the emulsified PEA had a 75% greater level of absorption than the micronized PEA. So, yeah, by, by emulsifying it, you're really getting value for money. You're getting that efficacy. You, you're getting a better, you know, result and, and a better sort of um, better idea of, you know, that it's actually going to do the full effect that it can. Right. So I think the race now with uh, industry is going to be to, um, just like we saw with curcumin, is going to say this increase in, I hate the word bioavailable, it's not, it's absorption, um, but this increased absorption mechanisms um, through various tactics, through the, um, through various vehicles of emulsification or things like that, um, possibly even maybe by combining it with other things. Maybe that's the way, the thing that we're always missing. We, we want it to do its job. Food isn't like that. Um, mm. Foods work in concert with each other. But anyway, um, so one of the issues I have is that when we look at, let's say what we look at today, let, let, let's say PEA. We look at PEA, what the biochemistry is, where it works, and then we go downstream. What happens to clinicians is they're faced with a patient in pain, they have to work backwards and they have to say, is this the inflammatory signals that PEA is going to action against? So how do we help the two connect? Like, is there, are there any conditions where PEA absolutely just sings? Like you're talking about diabetes. There's an interesting comorbid you know, situation, you know, there's never just diabetes. So do you find that it works across the board or do you find that it tends to work in subsets of diabetics? Um, no, that's a really good question. It's um, it's not a miracle cures everything um, molecule. There are certain things that it works really well with. And then I've found like just um, there's research, you know, that it's more of, um, a chronic sort of inflammation, um, mast cell activation as well. So when you're getting like allergies, um, it's worked well with that because it works on that mast cells. Um, it's worked, like I said, with diabetes, um, the peripheral neuropathy is an interleukin-6 inflammation issue. So if you've got a, a really good way to find out what's going on with your clients is, of course, coming back to doing pathology testing, um, especially when you're looking at inflammation markers and you want to know what, what it is particularly you've got to address and, and to help guide you what treatments are going to be best to use for that client. So if you're looking at interleukin-6, um, which is come up in the diabetes um, that works in PEA, we found in our research, works very well if you've got that interleukin-6 um, high levels. It also helped in our study bring down CRP levels. So that's just your general acute inflammation. So anyone that's got, yeah. um, you know, pain or like skin conditions, if you've got, you know, possibly if it's signs of leaky gut, I mean, obviously you've still got to work with the gut and, you know, you still got to apply all those naturopathic principles to, you know, treating the whole person. Um, but there's been more studies come out showing that it works well with eczema. So that's the, that inflammation driven and it's coming out wow. in the skin. So, um, so if they've got skin issues, it can be helpful with that. You can use it either internally or topically. It works really well mixed into creams. Um, osteoarthritis is a massive area that kind of gave PEA that, that leg in to become more available um, to us as practitioners and it also helped it become listed with the TGA. So osteoarthritis is um, just such a huge area that PEA can really help with. Um, the other areas that I've found in clinic and there's other research out there, um, but in clinic I've particularly found um, I've got clients with endometriosis and that's another big inflammation-driven area. Um, I've found PEA really helpful with that. Um, I've found I've had a people, couple of people with um, side effects of a mast cell 
stimulated uh, infection that has, um, if you do, if you look into like the, the infection that they've got, it's got activated mast cell levels. Um, and cool. that's really brought, that helped bring that down. Um, so it's best advice I could give is, is kind of like research either the conditions that you've got that you're seeing in clinic or the symptoms that um, your clients are showing and going, okay, is this inflammation driven or, you know, most of the time yeah. it is. But if it, I found and the research hasn't really been showing that autoimmune conditions are suitable for PEA. It's a different system. It's, it's you know, you got your innate immune system is, is going haywire there. So that's not an area that's greatly been studied. It may help with that. I've not really used it in clients for autoimmune conditions because I see more like chronic illness. Um, I see a lot of like PCOS and, and diabetes and, and that sort of more ongoing information. Yeah. Um, but um, it also um, has the other way you could use PEA is when someone's got a lot of information or a lot of acute pain, you can use PEA, as you were saying, in combination with other treatments that works really well to kind of make sure you're covering all your bases. So like you could use PEA right. for, you know, if it's, it's got that, you know, in, um, ongoing, you know, immune um, inflammation stimulation. And then, you know, if you've got someone with an autoimmune disease, you could bring in your other tools that help with that. And, but say if they're also experiencing pain or if, if you know, they've got a skin condition coming through, mm. then you can use it together. Um, it works, PA works, you know, as you said, with turmeric, that's a beautiful combination. Um, quercetin is really good if they've got, you know, allergies. There's a few different things going on there, but allergies is really great. PA yep. can help bring that down. And then the quercetin helps, you know, with the, the immune, um, that histamine response as well that's going on. Um, Boswellia is great for, you know, other people with, with pain. Um, and as I was saying, it's getting brought into creams as well now. So you can use it topically. You can bathe in it. It's great. <laughs> can Can I ask, when you're making a cream, you've got to be mindful, obviously, to make not an aqueous cream, but a fat-soluble cream, so a more emollient type cream. Do you, do you tend to favour ointments over creams or what sort of base do you use? Um, the ones that I've seen in, I've not made one myself, but I know people that are developing creams and it's from what I know they're doing, it's a vitamin E based cream. So yeah, it's definitely needing that, that sort of, right. you know, uh, fatty, fatty acid, acid nutrients that are yeah going to get absorbed through the skin. If, if you mixed it into aloe vera, that would, I don't think that would work well as well at all. Cause it's, right. it's not That's getting so interesting because yeah. there's, a, there's, there's so many people that aren't, satisfied with the treatments they're receiving for eczema um, for atopic dermatitis mm. and so they're searching for alternatives and I think anything that can take another edge another degree down to help normalize their skin will you know it, it can be groundbreaking for them it can be blossoming for their self-esteem because um, they go through hell these people same with psoriasis actually any use in psoriasis yeah, that's another study um, that lets another area that um, is going to be open to more research as well. Yeah, skin, chronic skin conditions and PEA creams um, are a big area that, yeah, could be more uh, researched. Um, and the people I know that have just used it in clinic have had great results. But, um, yeah, there's some uh, exciting projects that I can't mention, but uh, in, in time um we should be seeing stuff come out about that uh, i do know cool. of one trial going on at the moment so if someone contacts me about it i can let them know what it is i don't know if i can mention it here no that's fine no <laughs> secrets it's okay we nearly got yeah. a secret out of you know that's fine um no just yeah. for just for email me listeners. i can tell you about it <laughs> yeah but for all of our listeners you can't um uh, reveal any sort of research secrets until a certain point, until the research is in, because it affects the research. So, um, uh, so what about things like use in medications? So, for instance, I'm thinking about people, say, with sciatica. They're in chronic pain. They're screaming out for pain. The Australian government, indeed governments around the world, 
have now dammed and dampened the access to opioids. And, you know, for instance, where people used to be chronically using opioids for migraines, not necessarily responsibly, not necessarily healthily, I'm, I, I admit, but the access to opioids was quite free. Um, now it's a real struggle for people to get opioids, particularly if they're in the lower socioeconomic class because doctors are now charging above the medical rebate, the uh, Medicare rebate, um, and no fault through their own. So it's becoming a real issue to get adequate pain relief for these people. Um, does or can PEA help to make opioids more effective or dampen the inflammatory signal so that the opioids can do their job? That's uh, a really good area to talk about, Andrew. Um, and that's part of the research um, trial that I did. All the people that we had with peripheral neurodiabetes, uh, sorry, peripheral neuropathy with diabetes, they um, first of all were medicated for their diabetes. So everyone was on um, some form of blood sugar medication. So either metformin, there were people on insulin, there were people on combinations. So we had everyone already using medications and that was part of the trial as well to see if PEA could be used safely across, um, alongside medications. And then the other thing that um, with medications was going on was that pretty much everybody was using a form of pain relief. So these were all people with ongoing, long-standing, chronic nerve pain. People had numbness, uh, stabbing pains, you know, all that the really very uncomfortable, very debilitating pain. And a lot of people were using NSAIDs, some were using Panadol, some were using aspirin. There were people on opioids like your Lyrica, your Endone. There was a big mix of those different pain medications. Um, and some people found that uh, well, a lot of people found that it just wasn't working for them anymore. They'd have to go on increased doses. And as you said, like people start can can start using them and then they find that they can't taper off them. And, and some doctors uh, either go, well, there's nothing else that can work for your condition. We don't have anything else. Or they, you know, some may be reluctant to reduce the dose or people find that they reduce the dose and then the pain comes back. And so a lot of people, yeah, they feel that they get stuck taking these medications that are either not effective for them anymore or they're, you know, they all have um, their own, you know, side effects or, you know, risk of dependency. Um, so that was what we were really interested in looking at is can PEA help also people taper down um, these pain medications that they're having to take. And we found, so not, not everybody was able to reduce their medications. There were some people with severe P, um, peripheral neuropathy that the PEA, the PEA was very effective in reducing the pain in the people that were taking PEA. So there was a group taking placebo and then there was a group taking the PEA. Um, and yep. the people taking the PEA had drastic, significant pain reduction from just two weeks. And um, over time, so the study went for eight weeks. And then over time, we sort of checked in, like we checked in with people every two weeks, but we kept asking, you know, how's your pain levels? Are you having to take any rescue medication? And for this study, the, um, everyone was sort of told to stay with the regular medications that you take. We don't, you know, we don't want you to come off your medications because some people would be in excruciating pain and that's not ethical. Yeah. So everyone stayed on their medications. Um, some people occasionally required Panadol or Nurofen as like emergency medications. That was fine. We just recorded it and, and you know, asked how it was going. And what we found is that there were some people that didn't need their emergency medications anymore. So some people would have to take like Nurofen or something for before they went to sleep because a lot of people find that their pain is worse at night and it wakes them up during the night. So a lot of these people, um, their sleep was greatly effective and some people found they didn't need, you know, they, they could sleep a lot better, which improved their quality of health greatly, 
um, but yeah, they didn't need to use that that extra medication. And then there were some yeah. people, like all these people, were all still monitored by their doctors. So we didn't we didn't encourage them to stop taking you know any medications they were on. But some people found you know when they had follow up appointments with their doctor. Um, they would say, you know, I'm, I'm using PEA and I'm finding the pain is really helpful. So some people were able to work with their doctor at reducing those those really strong medications and, and some people were able to come off them. Some people were able to take less of the amounts. Some people that were using them only every now and then didn't you need them as often. So there was that really great efficacy of reducing their pain but also helping people use less of those very strong medications and, and that was great to see. Um, and then, you know, the, the safety of using PEA with these medications we found um, was great as well. No one, you know, everyone stayed very stable. Um, no one had any side effects. PEA has a really, really good safety profile. Um, so no one had, you know, issues. There was no liver issues. There was no kidney issues, like apart uh, outside of what they came into the study with. Um, yeah, 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 no one developed yeah. severe reactions. Um, people just, yeah, in terms of their medications, if they felt like um, some people with PEA, because it works on that, that uh, indirectly works on that endocannabinoid system, um, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. Some people that may have be very sensitive to that particular system. Um, you know, we were like, oh, is anyone going to fa- start feeling funny with, with PEA? But uh, no, there was there was none of that. Other people have reported in other studies they have, but in this particular group, no one did, okay. maybe because they were already in so much pain. Um, but, yeah, it, it had a very good safety profile with other medications and helping people come off those very strong medi- medications. Gotcha. And what about relevant dosages? Like, you, you know, you say it doesn't work in some people. Is it like, for instance, you're talking about um, um, uh, gabapentin um, previously, um, uh, and that, that's a drug well known for a titration. You know, if, if 75 doesn't work, then they take 150, 300, blah, blah, blah. Um, did you have to titrate the dose in any of these patients or were you restricted in the research for just using that standard dose that you chose? Can you tell us a little bit more about relevant dosing? Yeah, uh, well, in the trial, everyone, um, there was just one dose of PEA and everyone stayed on the same amount for the whole trial, which was 700 milligrams of the emulsified PEA. Um, But what I do in clinic, because I can, you know, treat people individually, in clinic, I definitely titrate. So um, if I've got someone, especially usually when I start seeing a client or I start um, they start on PEA, they'll start at a higher dose, especially if there is that that high level of chronic pain. You want to bring that pain down, you know, as, as safely but as quickly as you Quick. can. So doing a high dose of PEA, like I usually do 600 milligrams of the emulsified PEA, um, breaking that into 300 milligrams twice a day because you do need to spread it out during the day. Um, by doing that for, depending on the client, but usually I'll probably say, you know, take the high dose for at least a month. That way we're really bringing down that inflammation, we're bringing down the pain. And um, and then after a month, I'll check back in with the client or like after the bottle runs out, which is, you know, depending on what, what I'm using is usually about a month. Um, I'll check back in with the client and go, how are you going? Have you found your pains reduced? Have, you know, and then I check through with like the other symptoms that are going on and the other processes. Um, but if I find that people are getting that relief or once people get that relief, especially from pain, and then they start to stabilize and I go, okay, well, what really happens there is that once you bring down that inflammation, the body then can, as I was saying how like the body makes PEA itself. And when there's really high inflammation, that that system gets broken. When you bring down that inflammation by doing high dose acute PEA supplementation, you can break, you can stop that inflammation spike. You can stop that like immune, um, that really high inflammation production. The body can start to sort of settle down and that connection back to making your own PEA can restart. Um, so eventually the body can start making its own PEA and then, you know, you, 
knowing how long Ah. that's going to take is going to vary for each client depending on how much is going on. And, you know, you've still got to look at other issues. You know, you've got to look at their diet. You've got to look at their stress levels. So you've still really got to bring it into that holistic practice. But once you've brought down that inflammation and they're, you know, they've got their stress levels under control or, you know, whatever it is that's going on in their life, you can, I often go, okay, let's try to take it back. Let's, let's try to peel back the PEA. Let's maybe do like, you know, if, if they're um, 150 milligram capsules, okay, let's try one capsule less a day and see how you go with that. And then, you know, right. if their pain spikes back up, it's like, okay, well, you're not ready yet. So we like wait another month and go, okay, let's try it again. Or if people, you know, after a month, their pain levels come back down, their everything else is settling down, you go, okay, let's take it, take the dose back. Let's juice by just one capsule at a time. If they're okay with that, then maybe two weeks we might try or give it another month and go, okay, let's see if we can reduce it back again. And some clients I've found can, you know, after a couple of months of like starting with the high dose and then bring slowly bringing it back down, um, you know, if they've fixed up their diet and, you know, they're, they're managing their stress, they can come off PEA because their body has been able to kickstart that natural PEA production again. Other people and, and other conditions, if they've not fixed their diet or they've got other stuff going on, they might need to keep using it. It might need to stay yeah. being a high dose. It might need to stay being a low dose. So you really just got to use your clinical insights, your clinical intuition, and just keep checking in with your client and going, you know, how are you going? What, what you know, what's been going on? And, and if they look like this, basically, if they look like they're still struggling, I don't recommend lowering the dose until you've worked on, you know, what else is going on with the client. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Amanda, there's so much more to learn. Thank you so much for sharing us your research, um, which I think is so important, but also how we can use PEA to sort of weave through, I guess, to uh, a support network, if you like, for patients in pain but also um, other inflammatory diseases. We didn't even touch on things to do with the mast cell activation syndrome, like, for instance, mold, you know, ADSD, um, autism spectrum disorder, things like that. Um, But I thank you so much for sharing us what we could today on Wellness by Designs. I hope to get you back on again soon. Thanks, Andrew. I could talk about this forever. (laughs) I look forward to it. It sounds great. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. You can find all the other interviews and, of course, the show notes on this interview on the Designs for Health website. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This is Wellness by Designs. 